of you who are not familiar with the J.W. Graham Medal in Computing and Innovation, it was, uh, this medal has been created to recognize the leadership and many innovative contributions to the university and to the Canadian computer industry by J. Wesley Graham during his career as both a professor and university administrator. Wes Graham's accomplishments are many. He created a computing infrastructure that has made Waterloo, Waterloo's name synonymous with computing and computer science throughout the world. He led several teams of experts that created the software that established Waterloo's reputation in computing, and he established a model that has been used so successfully in creating many of the computer companies that have been spin-offs from the University of Waterloo's research and innovation. The J.W. Graham Medal is awarded annually, normally to a graduate of the Faculty of Mathematics at the University of Waterloo, currently in business, government, or education, who exemplifies many of the qualities shown by West Graham during his career. This is the tenth time the medal has been awarded, the first time being in 1995 to Mr. who's here with us today. Terry Stepien also won the medal a year or two ago, and I don't know, I don't see any other former medalists, but uh, welcome to uh, Terry and Marie uh, as well. Today, this year, the 2004 winner of the Great Medal of Computing and Innovation is David Yaw. David is a Senior Vice President of Software and Research and Motion Limited, the makers of the popular BlackBerry wireless solution. He has overall responsibility for a full, wearers, full range of software produced at RIM, which includes low-level signal processing and DSPs, handheld device, real-time operating system, hand system handheld-based Java virtual machine, Java-based handheld applications, Windows NT-based corporate servers, all the way through to a fully redundant distributed server network operating center. Uh, David received his, his Bachelor of Mathematics from the University of Waterloo in 1983, but he actually attended the University of Waterloo a, a summer or two when he was in high school as one of the, uh, uh, as an invited guest because he had done so well in the Canadian mathematics competitions that had been running for, for many years. After his uh, undergraduate degree from Waterloo in mathematics, he received an MBA from Wilfrid Laurier University in 1988. After completing his undergraduate degree, and in fact while, while completing his undergraduate degree, David worked at uh, Wacom, an early UW spin-off, developing language interpreters and compilers. His work there included the design and development of Wacom C and C++, the Wacom SQL database, more popularly known as SQL Anywhere, and the industry's first complete ODBC implementation. David has been at RIM since 1998, and in addition to his management responsibilities, has continued to be involved in the design and sometimes the implementation of the end-to-end -end BlackBerry solution. He's the inventor or co-inventor on numerous patents and patent applications. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Dave Yaw, the 2004 winner of the Grand Medal for Computing and Innovation. Thank you, Steve. All, all that wording sounded a lot better in print. <laughs> it takes a long time to read. Well, I, uh, as I look out here this morning, I feel a little bit like my life is flashing before my eyes. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces, uh, many current co-workers, many former co-workers, um, and some faces that I recognize from uh, my uh, time here at the University of Waterloo. And of course, I've never been very far from the University of Waterloo, um, I have stretched as far as working a block away, <laughs> but I moved closer when I went to RIM. So uh, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to uh, be getting the, uh, the uh, J.W. Graham medal. Um, my first encounter with Wes Graham was uh, just, just behind here in the uh, theaters over in the math and computer building where Wes was teaching CS180 at the That's off. Okay, just maybe cut the volume a little. That's probably better. I'll just make sure I am good volume. Uh, so I had West for CS180, and uh, even though it was teaching COBOL, uh, the real lesson from West wasn't so much about what the language was, but it was more how to think and how to problem solve. 
And uh, probably the reason I ended up at UW was I liked math, I liked solving problems, and then I discovered uh, that actually having access to a computer allowed me to solve a different form of problems and, uh, 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 and uh, really became um, a passion of mine was, uh, was uh, writing, writing computer code, which is something I don't get to do very often, and when I do, I get told not to. So. <laughs> So I had to, uh, one of the, the price of getting this award is I have to prepare a presentation and in, in uh, all true presentation fashion I had to have a, uh, the uh, abstract together about a month and a half ago which I created with no thought at all about what I was actually going to speak about. So uh, I have uh, uh, put together uh, what I'm going to talk about is efficiency. Those of you who have worked to, uh, with me will recognize the topic. It's something that I've always um, worked hard for uh, in what I've been doing and pushed hard for, for from the people who uh, work for me. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit how efficiency has changed and then uh, a little bit how nothing's really changed at all. And then at the end, um, as a, as a uh, sort of separate topic, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, not just an efficiency, but what have I learned over the last uh, 21 years since I left university. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, Steve covered my background pretty well um, in, uh, in reading uh, out uh, what I had done. The, um, certainly the, uh, the, the uh, beginning of my career, um, I had, a, as I said, a passion for writing efficient code. And efficiency meant a whole lot of things. Uh, it meant code that ran fast, didn't use much memory, um, tried to solve problems that um, perhaps were viewed as impossible without more resources. Uh, we have, I see a lot of faces uh, in here who uh, worked with me and, and had similar passion uh, uh, during those years, but it was always a drive to get efficiency out of the computer. And that, as I was thinking about what to talk about today, I thought, well, that, um, you know, I want something that reflects what, what I believed in, and uh, so I, I chose the efficiency thing. I also, um, and people who know me, um, I had a bit of a penchant for trying to do things that people really didn't think were possible. Um, sometimes I didn't know it was impossible, uh, and I've always found that not knowing it's impossible makes it much easier to get the job done. <laughs> a good example of that was the ODBC driver we worked on uh, back in oh, a little over a decade ago, 1992. At the time, ODBC had just been invented by Microsoft. and. Uh, not to go into gory details, but there was three levels of implementation. And for some reason, it uh, must have been the, all the math grads who were at uh, Microsoft because it started at level zero. Instead of, so there's level zero, one, and two. And so we felt we needed a level two implementation. At the time, I was actually managing, but we ran out of developers, so I said I would write it myself. And so we, I implemented a full level two implementation. Well, it turns out... Microsoft had never done a level one or level two implementation, so there's all sorts of uh, interesting anomalies and so on to work around. But it, um, I was just trying to get that to fit. More recently, um, I had the, uh, the opportunity and somehow was successful to convince management at RIM that it makes sense that a mobile device like this should have a Java virtual machine on there. Not only should it be, there be a Java virtual machine, but that all the applications should be written in Java and nothing in native code, which was, uh, or in C code, which was a, um, the opposite of wherever the rest of the world was heading. And uh, uh, we've, you know, and there's a lot of people in this room actually who have suffered through my vision, but we've been successful and uh, and uh, got that done. So I like, uh, as I said, like efficiency, like, like pushing the limits, like seeing what do I think is possible and uh, seeing that come to fruition. And uh, certainly it's been a real ed education working on BlackBerry and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, try not to do an advertising pitch here, however, the most efficient way for me to do a talk is to talk about stuff I already know rather than having to research anything else. So, I call this the efficiency hypothesis. I figured I'm in the math building. I make, should make this sound really highfalutin. Um, it really uh, isn't. The, if you look back at what computing was like and um, I look around this room, I'm glad to see that it looks like there's some students that are here. This is all stuff before you were born. Um, <laughs> 
I have to tell you one of the most depressing things in, in my life was having co-op students that weren't born when I graduated from UW. I, it, it took me a while to, <laughs> to, uh, to get over that one. Um, recently, in fact, I've, uh, we've hired a student who was a baby at my wedding. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> So back in the dark ages, um, computers, big, expensive things. Um, and so there was a lot of effort to say, if you're going to use this big, expensive thing, you, you have to you know, wring out every ounce of performance, of uh, opportunity out of that equipment, because it just costs so much. The, um, one of the things that, uh, of course, impressed all of us with as much gray hair as I have when we arrived here was the Red Room with that big 360 sitting there that filled up, seemed to fill the whole room and tapes around it and operators running and uh, now this was a university environment and, and to, to you know, the vision that um, I think you know, certainly Wes Graham was a key in bringing that here but to have all that computing power um, and waste it on students was just an um, amazing amount of, of foresight, but that kind of equipment in industry would be running seven by twenty-four, not because um, uh, that people uh, felt that it needed to be, but they had invested this money in the computer, so you better be using it all the time and make use of the resources that are there. And that what you want to do then, efficiency in programming became very important because you had to fit everything through that one computer. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 and of course, everything. <laughs> I feel like I'm on one of those video games the kids play with the dancing, you know. <laughs> um, and we had to invent everything. Um, I mean, it's hard for us to remember, but uh, a lot of what uh, Wes did with the foundation back then was going around t teaching structured programming, right? Trying to teach people not to use go-tos. And um, we've come so far now, uh, and we're... Let me try moving. No, I've got that turned off. Well. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to talk loud. All this wireless technology, it'll never go anywhere. <laughs> so, um, looking back to when I graduated, 1983. Uh, when I was working at Whatcom, for the, uh, I was in co-op, and so the work terms just before I graduated, we got some of the first IBM PCs in the world coming in uh, to the computer systems group and into Whatcom. And uh, it's interesting just to look back at what those machines were. I uh, even managed to find a picture of what we used to live with. Um, 4.77 megahertz. And the amazing thing is all of us who lived then have that number burned into our minds. Like it's not 5, it's not 4, it's 4.77, because that extra 0.77 made a difference. Um, you know, versus the computer I can buy now for $1,000, which is a 3 gigahertz computer. That's a factor of about 600. To give you some, I mean, it, it boggled me when I thought about that saying, well, that means that something that my computer at home could do in 6 seconds today would take an hour back then. Okay, so um, my feeling is that The Sims would not have run very well, or any of the other games that my kids now play. Um, you know, 640K limit, but of course, none of the computers we have are so grandiose as to have that much, so most of them are around 256K. Um, in here were floppy drives, 160K, they, they went up to 180 and then 360. Um, who could need more? But the, the important thing here is it was dedicated to one user. And, it, you know, you look around today, 
and um, I'm surrounded probably by half a dozen computers. There's one here, there's one here, there's probably one in each of these microphones. Um, so it's become so ubiquitous versus that old red room. Um, but even in this day, um, we were working on the PCs, we were also working on mainframes, and every one of them was a constrained environment, uh, uh, efficiency, efficiency, optimization, um, and, and trying to make, make best use of the computing resources. So things we did. We wrote a lot of assembly language. I mean, we were just coming out of the era where we were convincing people to, that we didn't have to write everything in assembler, that we could actually write things in a high-level language like C. Um, at that time, <laughs> Uh, actually, one of the biggest uh, things that happened shortly before that was that AT&T Bell Labs decided that they weren't going to make C essentially proprietary by charging everybody to use it. And so uh, it started taking off in the world. Compilers are really important. This was, you know, uh, at that time a passion of mine, doing a code generator and you get this thrill because I got, you know, three bytes out of the code size um, generated from the same piece of source code. Um, and I see John there. I remember berating him when he was a student for using a divide in a program um, because it was, if you look at the clock cycles, it was like 160 clock cycles. I couldn't afford that. And so uh, everything was, was concentrating on, on trying to, and I, I don't mean to go on and on about this, but it's, uh, there's so many people today uh, in computing who have no idea um, what the amount of computer resources we waste every day um, compared to how, uh, well, anal we used to be about uh, getting the maximum out of the computer. Uh, things, decisions like, you know, agonize over having to change something from 8-bit to 16-bit. And God forbid you went to 32-bit, because, especially on the, on the PC, because it was a 16-bit processor. So 32-bit stuff was all um, uh, really expensive because it was all runtime routines and so on. Uh, data structures used to pack, a lot of bit packing. And in many cases, um, you know, there was always the, the, the faction that said, well, the compiler should be able to handle all the bit packing. And uh, the other group that said, well, I'm going to do the ands and ors and shifts and xors myself because that way um, I know I'll get the efficient code that I need to get. Um, I used to look at code size all the time. I remember agonizing and spending time just trying to get things into 64K blocks because of some architectural restriction that... Uh, called segmentation that we used to have to live with on, uh, on the uh, IBM PC and on the old 8088. So again, concentrating on the computer resources. Fast forward now 20 years to the world I live in today. So 20 years ago, we were writing programs that ran on the PC, or they ran on an IBM mainframe, or they ran on a DECVAX. Today, the, um, I mean, Steve mentioned a lot of stuff, but this is the world I live in. Uh, we have mobile devices, uh, we have a wireless network, uh, there's software that runs in the infrastructure, some of the team that works on that is here, uh, that actually does uh, routing of messages, um, going over the internet, which of course didn't really exist back then. I remember when we first got an internet connection, one of the things we had to sign up for was no commercial traffic over the internet. Can you imagine? Uh, <laughs> And then we have a server, and so this is a server uh, that runs on uh, NT Windows uh, XP class machines, and all this works together to build one solution. So there's a lot of technology here, and a lot of pieces have to work together, and, but if somebody asks me, what's BlackBerry and what is it about, and again, I'm using an example that's close to my heart, and there's lots of examples out there. But what is BlackBerry? And I don't say it's about this piece of hardware. It's not about a wireless GSM, GPRS network, or CDMA. It's not about email. I don't even say it's about email. BlackBerry is about saving you an hour a day. So it's all about the user efficiency. Um, this really hit home to me. I was talking to somebody who uh, uh, worked for one of the financial institutions in New York a few years ago who were some of the first adopters of this particular technology. And he said, you know, I used to, I get so much email, I usually, even with a BlackBerry, I can't get it through during the day, but now, while I'm on the train ride home, I get through all my email, send my responses, and so when I get home at night, instead of going upstairs right after dinner and opening my laptop, I play with my daughter. And, it, and that really struck me as saying, we're actually making a difference in people's lives. And so there's all this technology, all these pieces going together, but the end goal is the efficiency of the person, not on the computer. 
you know, so the things we're concerned about is how efficiently can somebody use this? Um, you know, there's a bunch of buzzwords here about unconscious carry and task oriented. The real measure for me, and, and um, we're not surprisingly over at RIM, we're poster children for Blackberries. Everybody there has one. And uh, how I know we're successful is when I walk by somebody's uh, desk and they're sitting in front of the, there's their computer, their three gigahertz Pendium, and they're sitting there with their hands on their device rather than using the computer. And I asked them why, and they said, well, it's faster. And, um, and it's not faster because the processor's better. It's faster because uh, there's a lot of effort put into optimizing the experience for the user, not the user, the, uh, what was happening on the computer. And so, um, you know, as I got to that, I started wondering, well, does that mean that really computing over my 20 years has changed from worrying so much, worrying completely about the efficiency of the computer. And now we've gone completely to the other end of the spectrum and we're worried about the efficiency of the user. And in fact, we have so much horsepower that it re the efficiency of the computer really doesn't matter. So I'll call that my first hypothesis because I'm, my next step is to prove it wrong. And I, I've got a couple of counterexamples. I'm going to start with talking about what we're doing in BlackBerry today. And, um, and the people who uh, are here who work with me on this, um, I, I'm sure will nod their heads a lot because they've heard this from me a lot before. But if we go through what we have here, all this stuff that puts together BlackBerry, well, what do we do? Well, we've got this server. We've got this enterprise server. It runs, um, it handles a few hundred users. It, within a corporation, gets their email out, and then it has to go through firewalls for security and all sorts of interesting things like that. Worried about scalability, reliability. Well, all of a sudden, as we get successful in a the corporation, they start saying, well, why can I only put 500 users on a server? Why can't I put 1,000? Well, fundamentally, the code's not very efficient. And so what do we have to do? We have to go through and do all that stuff we used to do on the servers to be able to get from 500 users to 1,000 users. And at the same time, we're still dealing with things like on the servers, the person who's administering the server, we want some user efficiency there, right? So rather than, you know, configuration files, we have a nice GUI and all that kind of stuff for administration. But there's, we're back to that world of trying to get efficiency. Now, we aren't recoding the whole thing in assembly language, and, uh, but we're still doing a lot of things where, you know, frankly, I heard some people say, well, it really doesn't matter that this is really efficient. And so we end up going through and better algorithms and, and more efficient use of memory and not copying things 14 times and, and all that. We have a network operating center. Um, you guys probably know, I, I think we're close to 99.99% .99 up time, four nines, uh, eventually striving for nine. Um, sorry, five. <laughs> Heart attacks over here and a couple rows up. <laughs> Uh, millions of users, billions of messages, and you start getting big scale. And so all of a sudden, again, it, you start, costs start adding up. So how many computers can you, how many users can you fit on, on one computer? And you start running issues not only of cost, you've got space, power, heat, all that stuff that comes with having uh, uh, a big room full of computers. And believe me, we have big rooms full of computers. There's probably about 250 computers. Is that a good number running that center right now. And so there's a big desire there to get the stuff through efficiently. The other thing is um, this is essentially routing traffic and so performance matters a lot. And then what happens as soon as you start worrying about performance then you start worrying about efficiency. And so we've gone through over the last couple of years and done a lot of work there um, doing the same things, improving the algorithms, preventing copies, getting things in and out more quickly. Um, uh, not communicating between computers any more than we have to, because all these things that we used to know, um, we're, we're using all over again. This is the interesting one. Um, this is what I learned from Mike Lazaridis, who's uh, our founder, CEO, and now chancellor of the university. He will eventually, I think, be king of all Waterloo, but... Um, Mike, uh, one of the things I really admire about Mike is he has a, a great uh, aptitude for taking a complex world 
and reducing it down to simple rules. So those first three things are Mike's simple rules for wireless. And uh, when you take these things together, a lot of things start making sense. Limited bandwidth. Today's technology, which a lot of people call 2.5G, is roughly equivalent to taking a city block in New York City and say we're going to do an internet feed on a single 13.2 kilobit line. Okay? And if that's not quite enough, maybe we'll get up to eight lines. Okay? So we're going to serve all the users in a downtown Manhattan block on 13K line. Now, sorry, there are a lot of people in this room don't know what kilobits are. Um, but you know, compared to a 10 megabit Ethernet, which is now considered old hat and everything is moving up to 100 megabit or gigabit, very low uh, uh, capacity. And a lot of this has to do with physics. You can only encode so much information on a radio wave that's running at 900 megahertz. And all of the hype about new wireless technology, if you drill right down to it, um, there's a finite amount of, of usable bandwidth, and usable has to do with the ability to actually propagate through buildings and not tear your liver apart and a whole bunch of things that I don't pretend to understand. But the, there's only so much available, and the new technology maybe gets a factor of two or three improvement in how much information you can squeeze in there by being more clever in terms of how you can encode the information while still keeping in the same uh, the same frequency spectrum. So what that tells me is it's a very finite thing and it doesn't follow Moore's law. So much in computing over the last 20 years and that going from 4.77 megahertz to 3 gigahertz is based on Moore's law, uh, which, you know, doubling every 18 months or however you want to phrase it, I think it was originally about how number of transistors, but we've all sort of extended that to basically mean computing power doubles. Bandwidth doesn't double. That doubling that they're getting is over technology that's 10 years ago. So it doubles, but at a rate of maybe 10 years. Battery life. Um, mobile devices tend to run on batteries because we all don't want to have 120 volt AC line running back home. Uh, batteries tend to grow at somewhere between 7 and 10 percent capacity per year with research and battery technology. So all of a sudden that means that batteries um, are a finite resource that you can't extend forever. And um, the other thing that's interesting, and of course I just parrot what I hear from Mike, but basically the amount of battery to transmit a bit doesn't change. Like, nobody gets better at that. You need so much power for to be able to transmit from a wireless device so it can make it out to the tower that's listening to it. And there's not much you can do about that. And so um, if you want to transmit more bits, you need more battery. And so eventually you get to the point where you either need a big battery or you have a battery that only lasts you for half a day. And, uh, you know, we're down to lithium batteries. As I recall, lithium is number three on the periodic table. There's not a lot of room for improvement there. There's helium and hydrogen left. Um, and neither one of them makes good battery technology that we know of today. So battery life doesn't grow. Uh, thermodynamics. This is the one that was not obvious to me. But, um, and uh, I vaguely remember a physics course where they had the word thermodynamics in it that I took here at U of W. But basically what it means is, uh, certainly we have a radio, as you use the radio and you transmit, particularly transmit, you generate heat. More bits, more heat. Eventually, you run into a problem where you got too much heat. In fact, some of the, 3G is the hype now in terms of high bandwidth stuff. A lot of the, uh, press had stories on the first 3G devices that were in Japan where the plastic melted. Why? Because they were doing all this high bandwidth communication. The other thing that happened with these demos was it's sort of like all the old um, uh, cable versus DSL commercials. You know, you're the first guy in your block with a cable modem. Everything's great. As soon as everybody else gets it, you're all sharing the bandwidth. Well, the same thing is true with wireless, particularly the 3G. So they would do demos doing, you know, streaming video or something over wireless. However, um, what that really means is that out of 100 people, 99 of them can't do anything because one guy's using up all the bandwidth. Um, and so those things together uh, make wireless a very constrained environment in terms of how much data you can actually send. And so we've spent a lot of effort uh, packing and, and cramming and trying to uh, get as much uh, 
happening in this system without actually using the wireless network. And to the point where this is a phrase that I coined a couple of years ago, although everybody else at RIM seems to claim ownership, but I'm pretty sure I'd, I came up with it. Um, but the best wireless applications actually use wireless the least. And why is that? Well, if you want to preserve the bandwidth, you, you just can't survive. So for example, um, you know, by this model, wireless browsing is a really inefficient use of the bandwidth. Why? Because you tend to get the same information all over, over and over and over again. You, you browse through uh, most websites, you end up with, this, with um, redundant information and information that has probably not changed a whole lot since the last time I looked at the website. I mean, a good example is the weather. I mean, it changes, but not that frequently. Um, and so I'm bringing down a lot of information. Similarly, if I'm bringing down stock quotes, the actual information for stock quotes, you know, back to my bit packing days, is probably about 10 bytes worth of info for a stock quote for a single stock. And yet I bring down a page that's got several kilobytes of information. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's still a couple of orders of magnitude more information than I actually need. And so net of this is, and uh, is that we spend a lot of effort just trying to ma maximize what we can get with a minimal amount of information going through there. You look at the handheld device. Um, these devices actually have a lot going on. There's certainly a lot more computing power here than that uh, IBM PC that I showed at the beginning, but certainly a lot less than that three gigahertz computer you, we all have sitting at home. Um, a lot of what happens today in wireless, and people may or may not be aware of this, is uh, uh, what they used to call a software-defined radio. But the state of the art, you use a digital signal processor, which is just really another uh, CPU with some uh, interesting instructions that help do signal processor processing and Fourier transforms and, um, frankly, a whole bunch of, uh, of math that I have long forgotten. Uh, but and is dealing with those signals that are coming in at 900 megahertz, 2 gigahertz, and trying to translate them back into bits. And so um, this is high-speed stuff. Guess what? It needs to be really efficient. And in fact, we're just getting to the stage at RIM and in the industry where people are willing to say, you know what, maybe we don't have to write absolutely all of it in assembler and hand code it. Maybe we can actually use, God forbid, C. Uh, and don't mention C++. And so um, we have a world here in 2004 where we have people writing a hand assembling code. Uh, sounds like 40 years ago. Um, we're running on a, as I mentioned, a Java virtual machine in our device. Um, and uh, there's a couple of folks here in the front row who have spent a lot of effort trying to make this thing actually work in a constrained environment. Again, a lot of optimization, a lot of efficiency, a lot of concerns here in 2004. Um, then we have people who wrote the Java applications that run on top of this, and we, we've discovered that um, you know, all Java environments are not created equal. Uh, when we hire a Java programmer off the street, the amount of memory they use doesn't seem to be a constraint, and it is in our world. And so, um, uh, again, we get a whole new education and efficiency again. Ironically, everything we learn here doing Java programs uh, on the uh, device would apply equally well on my PC, and my PC would be snappier and be able to do more. But most of the time, uh, people don't get to the point where it matters. And so, you know, certainly in the device world, we're living not much differently than we did 20 years ago when I started all this. Now, I was looking, for example, the other way. Um, I didn't have to go very far, and I thought back to uh, West Graham and what we did, the University of Waterloo did for computing. Um, I managed to actually find a picture of the old red room, and uh, and I think the 360 is in there somewhere. You're looking at it. <laughs> that is probably all of it. Um, I learned a few things looking at this problem. The problem was you had a computer, um, and as I mentioned, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, efficiency of using the computer. So all the tools, all the compilers that, that were used back then uh, when you created programs, their goal in life was that the ending program that you got ran as efficiently as possible so that when you ran that week after week or day after day, whether it be, you know, again, it was aimed more at the, um, at the uh, business market, whether you're running the payroll or whether you're running the scientific analysis, which is why you justified buying this computer, you wanted it to run as quickly as possible because you had a a long queue of other jobs that you had to run. Uh, now, I'm not sure who made the observation. I'll give credit to Wes uh, 
because after all the award is named after him, but looked at the problem and said, you know what? We're solving the wrong problem. We want to teach students. How many production runs are there for a student pro student's program? The answer is one. Because once you got that run that actually worked, you took the listing, everything was punch cards and listings at the time, but you took that listing and you handed that in and you never ran the production code again. So it became much more important to worry about how, the, uh, how fast the compiler ran, because you actually ran the compiler a whole bunch of times. And so how can you make the compiler run faster? And how can you make the uh, number of times you actually run the compile reduce? And so Watt 4 was born at the time, and it became and then when Watt 5 and Watt Ball and a whole bunch of teaching languages. What do they do? Better error diagnostics, both just getting the program to compile, and then when the program ran, to actually give you useful diagnostics at runtime rather than just giving you a hex dump. And, um, and, and so uh, managed to get, so the students could be much more efficient in creating and debugging their programs because they actually have better diagnostic tools. Now the tools used back then by today's standards would seem pretty um, minimal, but it, it's interesting that even back then, uh, you know, it's debatable, I guess, whether the goal was to optimize use of the computer still or to optimize the, the end user experience, but certainly the end user experience did get optimized in this. And, uh, and we uh, got, a, got a solution where uh, it was contrary to the conventional wisdom at the time. The other thing I learned from this one, of course, is that um, make sure that you're solving the right problem. <laughs> Right? Because the solution for the problem that worked elsewhere might be because they actually have a different problem. So, okay, I had to dig back a little bit in this one. I remember taking a course in CNO when I was here. There was linear programming. That's about all I remember. But there's a couple of key points I also, I guess, I also remember. Um, and I, so anybody who's still in math, ignore this lecture, pay attention to your profs because they know what they're really talking about. But this is what I got out of it. You end up in the real world, in this case what I'm talking about is the efficiency of the computer, the efficiency of the user, and there's a bunch of constraints. And those constraints then limit what you can achieve. And, in this, and so everything in here is what's possible. And so to get the best possible experience, uh, it becomes pretty obvious that you want to pick some point on this curve, or this group of lines. And if you want to maximize efficiency of the user, you pick this point, if you want to, or the computer, I should say. And if you want to maximize the efficiency of the user, you pick that point. Um, so that's what I remember. And so showing my PowerPoint skills, you can actually make a line pop up. Um, and so what that translates to is saying, um, if, depending on how much I weight the user versus computer, if I heavily weight the computer that I'm trying to get efficiency, I will tend towards this point. Similarly, if I, th if I weight the user a lot more, I tend to the point on the other side. And what you learn when you do linear programming is that no linear programming problem ever ends up there because those are the easy solutions. It always ends up that one of the other points um, where you actually n don't maximize either one of the dimensions, but you pick a solution that's a compromise, is actually the best overall system efficiency. And so what I got out of this, and what I remember from linear programming, is not so much the technique, but it's this whole idea that the optimal solution for um, a system is often never optimal for any one of the components, but it's, it's optimal overall. The trouble is, in real life, first of all, there's more than two dimensions. They're very rarely straight lines. Somehow, in linear programming, I always remember them being straight lines. And um, even if I knew that there were straight lines, I'm not sure I would actually be able to determine that what the equation for the line would be in real life. And, but it doesn't change the fact that what you have is a multidimensional problem. Uh, in this case, you have multiple things that you're trying to to maximize the efficiency of the user, the computers. In my BlackBerry picture, I have lots of components that um, uh, even on the computing side that enter into the efficiency thing. And yet I still, to get an efficient solution, I have to factor all those things and find um, something that works. And, and so um, I, the revised hypothesis after all of this is that 
Um, efficiency in the system is finding the equilibrium, finding that point that gives you, maybe not maximal in any one dimension, but gives you the overall system efficiency. So, uh, with that, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about, um, I decided I would actually do a top 10 list of the top 10 things I've learned uh, in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, um, and I've, I've sort of divided it into uh, three sections. But for programming, computing, um, this is the result of the talk. It's never a bad idea to be efficient, which is that uh, any time, well, virtually any time I, I or somebody who's worked for me has argued to me that it didn't really matter if we were efficient, we were wrong. And so uh, it's, it's just never a bad idea. The other thing I learned about efficiency is efficiency actually only, re only really matters when you're successful. So if you go back to my BlackBerry picture, efficiency really didn't matter until somebody wanted to go from 500 users to 1,000 users. You know, those damn users. They, <laughs> they stopped buying our stuff. We wouldn't have to make it so efficient. Um, but every system, and one of the things I've always tried to do is, uh, is try to look what I call, I mean, the end game, which, you know, if back in my day, the big thing was chess computing, you know, how to program uh, computer chess, and everybody wanted to talk about how to, to manage the end game. But if you look at where things are going to end up, if you plan to be successful, then you're going to grow. And if you're going to grow, then you're going to need more capacity. If you need more capacity, then you need to be efficient, or it's going to cost you money. This one I mentioned before, the best wireless applications use wireless the least. And this is one that um, I, I think is starting to get more popularly understood. But just because something is there doesn't mean you have to use it. And that applies, I think, to a lot more technology than just, just wireless. Uh, this is one I've talked a lot about uh, to people I know. Yeah, think a lot and write a little code rather than the other way around. There seems to me too many people who... Uh, who just go in and write a lot of code. Now, I don't mind if you think a little and write a little code, but um, <laughs> most, people, most people can't seem to do that. I mean, there's, there's a, uh, a famous literary quote, I think it was uh, from Mark Twain, that it, a very similar uh, thing, is, it, which is, uh, I apologize for writing you such a long letter, but I didn't have time to write a short one. <laughs> um, it's the same thing if I had to give this presentation in 10 minutes instead of an hour, it would take me a lot more time to prepare because you have to worry a lot more about what you're going to do. Same thing with computing and with programming. Um, what's really interesting to me is that there, is, there does seem to be, in, ma in many problem spaces, an order of magnitude difference in implementations between somebody who's thought a lot about the problem and somebody who's thought a little about the problem because they find a way to, and it's, it's all the stuff we've been teaching, you know, reuse and refactoring and, and basing on what you've done before. Yeah. Okay, now, after a few years writing code, I started moving into managing. And so there's a, a few key lessons I learned as managing a group of programmers. There's a whole bunch I didn't put in here. <laughs> But uh, this is one actually Ian taught me. If you're, hiring, if, if you're looking to hire somebody, when in doubt, say no. And every time I didn't do this, I regretted it. <laughs> uh, but you, you get a feeling about people. Now, of late, I've actually tried, tried to actually golf a little more. Somebody has now advised me that you should, uh, shouldn't do business with anybody until you golf with them, because they'll tell you a lot about how you, whether you want to do business with them and it's how they play their golf game <laughs> and how they score <laughs> and how they keep their score. Uh, this one I've always believed in. Hire smart people. You can teach smart people what you need them to know, but if somebody knows what you need them to know, you can't teach them to be smart. Um, corollary to this one is, and I tell this to a lot of people, I don't particularly care what I'm going to hire you for today because in six months, I'm sure you're going to be doing something different. So I want people who can manage that transition and uh, can work on lots of different problem spaces. A software developer who's engaged is an order of magnitude more valuable. Um, this is all about, uh, comes back to that, think a lot and write a little code. If you get the right people and they're really 
intent and, and keen on solving the problem. They can usually find a solution that's smaller, faster, tighter, uh, more efficient and uh, by thinking and, uh, and it's because they're concentrating and put their effort into the problem. And what I find is that people, uh, if they get, you know, you call it burnout or whatever, then all of a sudden um, they become way less productive and it's not just you know, a factor of 50% or a factor of two. It really feels like a factor of 10 in terms of what they're bringing to me um, and to the organization. So the corollary to that one is keep them engaged. Um, I, uh, one of the things I do, and it sounds silly, but every Friday at 3 o'clock, so we have 45 minutes, um, we have ice cream now in the summer. In the winter, if, it, if there's no snow on the ground, we'll try to get in uh, once a month um, as a reward for people. And uh, it's silly. It's not very much money. Sorry, guys. Don't listen. Um, <laughs> but people feel like, like they um, are appreciated, and it's kind of a fun thing. And always keep people engaged. Keep them... But also not just on the, the soft things, but in terms of the problems they get to work on, um, in terms of making sure they understand that they are making a difference. And certainly if they're not making a difference, get them to do something else. And uh, as I've moved on, some things I've learned about just leading um, a software group, and some of these apply elsewhere. Uh, yeah, if you can't find a solution, see, they wouldn't let you do this in university, and I, I really think that's a tragedy. Um, this goes back to the Wes Graham thing with what for. If you can't find a solution to the problem, make sure you're solving the right problem. Um, we end up, uh, it just happens over and over and over again, where um, if you think back on it, often what happens, too, is the... Um, the problem that you're trying to solve goes through the equivalent of the kid's game of telephone, where it goes through and through. So by the time it gets reported, for example, into the software development organization, it's been translated three or four times and is actually quite isolated from the original problem you're trying to solve. Um, the, uh, uh, the one saying that goes around at RIM a bit is, uh, if you think back, and this is again back my 20 years to the original Indiana Jones movie, in, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and uh, because the guy had only half the, uh, the instructions, the, uh, the bad guys are, are digging in the wrong place, and they celebrate the fact they're digging in the wrong place. That's, they're solving the wrong problem. And so um, make sure you're solving the right problem, and in some cases, uh, if you just change the problem slightly, because none of this is black and white once you get these multi-dimensional problems, the problem often simplifies tremendously. So, uh, yes, change the problem. So think about that for the university curriculum. Um, a few people in this room have heard me say this, okay, I'll let you go on and on, and once you finish telling me why it's impossible, then we'll start working on how we're going to fix it. Um, the point here is really, one of the joys I find with computing is there's, um, there's very few problems we can't solve somehow. Or, you know, apply number three, and you can actually solve a problem that's close enough that, um, that you can do it. Um, and the, ironically, most of these debates come around efficiency again. You know, can we make it small enough, fast enough? Can we make it fit? Um, and, uh, but sometimes you just need that belief that you can actually do it. I, I uh, you can probably tell you like movies, but the, uh, I get a thrill out of the scene in Apollo 13 where they have the filter problem, they have a square filter and a round pipe, and they come in, they dump the stuff on the table saying, here's what you have to work with. And I, and I thought, gee, that feels like what we do every day. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, square pipe. I mean, and software's so interesting. You know, I, I don't think I would have liked being an engineer, you know, saying, build a bridge from here to here. Um, because the software world feels more like, well, build a bridge from here to here, and a month later, said, well, take that bridge, but we just want it over here. And don't worry that it's twice as far. Okay? Um, and then, being true software guys, what we'll do is we'll get the bridge to stretch within 10 feet of either side. You, you can jump from there. Version 2 will... <laughs> yeah. 
you know, there's that, all that construction going over on uh, what used to be Matthews Hall. I don't know if it's still Matthews Hall. You know, if that was a software project, that'd be version one. It would be done. <laughs> and the number one thing I, I've learned, and uh, I think this is more, this is a lesson about life as much as it is uh, in software. Just do the right thing and do what it takes to do the right thing. Um, time after time, sometimes there gets to be a lot of excuses why we can't do things. But you know that what you really should do, and I don't care if that's business or in computing or in life, um, it's always better to do what you think you need to do, and even if that takes extraordinary effort. And we have a lot of people um, in a lot of circumstances who do that, and then that's what truly defines success. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. Any questions about anything? Yes. I actually have. It may be more. You say that there's, you know, the opposite end of spectrum from efficiency of the computer to the efficiency of the user. But is there no reason why you can't have both at the same time? Um, I think there's certain problem spaces where you can have efficiency of the user and efficiency of the computer at the same time. Uh, but there's always. Um, there's usually a trade-off, and it, it's partly how you measure it. So if I take an example, if you take the efficiency of the user today, um, I could do Microsoft Word, um, has a lot of stuff in there, but my observation is it doesn't run any faster on my 3 gigahertz computer than four versions of Word ran on my 200 megahertz computer. And because they've added a lot more stuff in there, um, so, uh, the efficiency of the user, arguably, is it better or worse? Could I run that old version? Um, but the efficiency of the computer is not being used, right? Somehow they've wasted, you know, 15 times the processing power to get me, as far as I'm concerned, the same amount of power. So they haven't been efficient on the computer. They've been efficient on the user. I think uh, there may be certain cases where you can get both. Like if the user is waiting for the computer, then yes, um, uh, uh, you can achieve both, but then there's other dimensions. There's always seems to be all the other dimensions to the problem. So I guess it's sort of a, it's a question of priorities, of course. You know whether or not you want to put more resources into finding out, the, you know, the user should you know have a good interface and so forth, as opposed to making it all you know tight and quick. But I just sort of think that they're not exactly mutually exclusive. Well, again, if you go back to the linear programming model, what's happened is that the desired slope has changed significantly. So in many problem spaces, um, I think it's more the case, though, well, that you can be efficient enough on the computer and get the efficiency for the user. Um, but, you know, could I do, could Microsoft Word be more efficient? Probably. But do I care? Probably not. Because, the, the, you know, I, it always comes down to me like economics or if you think about, I often think of it like water flow. Water, water always levels out, right? And, um, so you have uh, things always tend to flow until you get sort of an equilibrium of sorts. Uh, it always used to amaze me when we had, um, we get a new computer in. And back then everybody was sharing the same computers. And so we had, uh, I remember, I think we had a VAX and we went and we got a new 4341. There's nobody on the new machine. So everybody gravitates to the new machine because it runs so much faster because you're not sharing it with everybody else. And then what you find is that, that without any deliberate effort, Compiles take the same amount of time on both machines because, because the, the system just drives for equilibrium. That's back when the compile speed actually used to matter. Yes? Sure. Okay. And it's probably not a well-formulated mathematical hypothesis, but <laughs> unfortunately, the, the only real math I get to do is, is grade six homework. With my <laughs> <laughs> and the, yes? You, you talk about uh, efficiency of the user and of the computer, um, but you didn't really talk about the efficiency of the programmer. Well, and I think that's, uh, that's a good point, and I think there's a lot of dimensions to the problem. So. Um, there's just, and one of the things that uh, we've learned since those old, old days is back then it, we, view, we sort of put everything painted with the same brush. So every program had to be just as efficient. I think what we've learned now 
um, really amounts to the fact there's different equilibrium points or different priorities in different problem spaces. So, you know, just taking a typical business example, the payroll that runs every two weeks is not quite as critical as the manufacturing thing that runs, you know, eight hours a day or, or 24 hours a day. Um, and so efficiency matters differently. Uh, the, the vacation request system for the employees, it probably matters very little whether it takes one or two seconds to pop up. So efficiency is a lot. And, and so if it's much more efficient for the programmer to do it a different way. So it's another dimension to the problem. And again, that's why I said the, the problem is, is multi-dimensional. Um, and there's all those things to be factored in. And yes, doing efficient programming, like computer efficiency, is a lot less programmer efficient usually. Unless you start talking about maintenance or and or factoring the costs of that, if I'm successful, inevitably having to put the efficiency in anyways. Right? That somebody at work has a sign up saying um, uh, something to the effect of, if you don't have time to fix it now, um, when are you going to have time to fix it in the future? Right? It's, it's the usual, usual problem. Yes? I may have misunderstood something you said, but uh, in your digital signal processing, uh, did I understand you say you program, you're programming such? Yes. I, I guess I was under the impression that most of such processing now was you just bought the appropriate chipset. Well, what a digital signal, yes and no. Um, Digital signal processors are essentially microprocessors uh, with some uh, very unusual instructions that happen to be good in signal processing. When you buy a lot of um, DSP parts now, the firmware is already embedded in the part. It's burned into, burnt into ROM. And so what you buy is the whole piece that, um, but fundamentally under the cover, it's just programming. And so, uh, in fact, RIM's a little, probably a little unusual that we will buy somebody else's part and reprogram it because we want efficiency or uh, want to use it for a slightly different purpose. Other questions? Or questions about anything? Yes? You uh, speak about the efficiency of the user in terms of more or less making their work a little bit more efficient and giving them another, another avenue to do the work. But what about uh, finding tools to make the work less? So, for example, a person, the same investment banker or so, uh, who receives 200 messages a day, 10 of which are important. What about finding them a method of sorting that mail more easily or finding a way of handling the volume more effectively other than just by finding a different place to do it or a different time to do it? Oh, I think all of that has, uh, is applicable. And, uh, you know, that really, I think, is in the, um, uh, in the realm of, of, you know, if you don't, can't find a solution, change the problem. Um, the, uh, I mean, if you look back at BlackBerry, um, we take it for granted today, but when uh, Mike Lazaridis first envisioned it, the thought of taking a mobile device with that, at that time, probably an eight kilobit shared line um, and doing all your email on there, it's impossible. Because if you look at how much email volume you get, I would wager everybody in this room uh, gets megabytes worth of email every day. And so the answer is, well, solve a different problem. I just need to think I'm dealing with my email. So, for example, most of the email I get on here, I only get the first part of it. I don't get the full attachment. I, um, I have some email that's filtered out. And so there's a whole bunch of things we do to change the problem to make it more, that one uh, more computer efficient. Uh, in the case of the user, yeah, there's a lot of things you need to be able to do to make, their, uh, to make them make better use of their time. Or, fundamentally get them to do their jobs in less time. And today's work environment is such that you, it almost doesn't matter where you talk to people. Everybody's putting in more hours and uh, is feeling less and less personal time. Um, you know, some people feel this is an invasion on their personal time. And I won't comment on that because it pays the bills. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, all those things um, are all about making a more efficient use of somebody's time. I mean, one of the things that we, str we tried really hard to do with BlackBerry, for example, is that um, if I'm using my BlackBerry, I'm actually not thinking about using a computing device. I'm thinking about responding to the HR problem back at work, or I'm thinking about whatever problem it is that I have to solve as an individual, not as a computer user, that that's how I, and that's how I optimize 
my time. If I can get rid of spam, I mean, spam filters are a great example, right? I mean, get rid of 90% of the cruft that I don't want to see anyway. Other questions? Oh, yes? Um, do you have any ideas or insights like where you might want to take wireless communication next to the Like where you want it to be? Uh, where do I want wireless communication to be? The, um, I think we're going to see certainly um, convergence of, reconvergence of voice and data. Certainly voice over IP is, is, is a big thing. I think uh, what we're going to, if you look at wireless in general, there always seems to be this big hype and then it squeezes back down to reality and then the next big hype and back down to reality. And the, the new reality is always just a little bit better than the old reality, but nowhere near what the promises were. Um, where I see wire, wireless is becoming more ubiquitous, we're going to see less and less wired stuff. Wi-Fi is a good example of that. Uh, fewer and fewer people actually run Cat5 cable through their home. Um, and so what we're going to find is that we're going to have, um, I think, wireless communications throughout our lives and it's going to tend to follow me around where, and you know, whatever device I happen to be using today, um, I envision um, a world where I'm going to have my, my work phone or device and my weekend device and things will just tend to follow me. A lot of it ironically ends up being server based then. And then the real intelligence is, is managing the, the uh, bandwidth effectively because you know what, those, those bandwidth constraints are not going away. So the, the real question is optimizing. Where I also see a lot of emphasis in the wireless world then is um, rededication to solving the real problem and uh, less of the, uh, uh, I guess what Mike would call the features arm, arms race. Because at some point, um, most of the phones you can go buy um, at you know, Rogers or Bell have way more features than even the people in this room, and we're all geeks. <laughs> Almost all. <laughs> um, way more t technology than we need, and so it's going to be more about utility and um, how can I solve my problems in my day um, not solve the problems that were introduced by getting the wireless device. Yes? As developers, should we be at a point now with the evolution of computers where we can write programs to focus on the users and let the compilers do the optimization and stuff that, like you said, that line in the ASM code, you know, let the compiler do something that optimizes? Well, there's certainly um, uh, better tools are always important because they, um, although the goal of efficiency is um, may not change. I mean, the, we talked about the efficiency of the programmer. Uh, certainly, um, as that slope has tilted up, yes, concentrating the efficiency of the user makes a lot more sense. It only makes sense to, uh, you know, say, do the assembly code and code that um, becomes critical and for performance. And most of the stuff in the user interface doesn't really matter. Now, the guy at Microsoft or doing open source for Linux who programs the widgets on the screen, he may need to do all that stuff. Or the guy who does the, uh, the MIDI player for uh, music files may end up, but then everybody else gets to share it. I mean, that was the whole goal of software port reusability was to, and we've actually achieved it, although not in any of the ways that we talked about, certainly when I was going through it, which is, you know, reusability now is all these big core screen components, whether it be a MIDI player or a windowing system or, um, a communications library. We have all these big green components and then you can actually build applications a lot more. Now, on the flip side, um, what I find with user interfaces is we still have a tendency to kitchen sink. So, you know, right now I've got a 120-inch uh, eh, monitor. So I can put a lot of stuff on that screen. So as I get requests for more and more features, I say, okay, sure, you know, I've got another foot down here that I... And what I've observed is that the people... Um, certainly doing applications for our, our wireless device, even outside of RIM. The ones that are really successful are successful because they actually can't do everything from, from here that you could do from the big screen, but they do what's important. They do what the people actually use. And um, that's the part I think we've lost a little bit sight of. We got, it's become so easy to do everything. We lose sight of actually trying to understand the problem in the problem space and reducing it down. You know, we have to reduce it to a two-inch screen from a hundred-inch screen. It makes you think a lot harder about the problem. It goes back to think a lot, write a little code, rather than the other way around. Yes? Um, one more recent 
popular programming methodologies is XP or string programming. And what stands me is that uh, it seems to go against a lot of the, the principles that you mentioned. And one in particular that really stands out in my mind is how in XP you, you just pro program it and then keep back to improve it. And that really goes against your, one of your uh, top endpoints where you think, like you just mentioned, think a lot, program a little. So I'm wondering what's your take on it and how how the efficiency can be more so implemented within XP. Well, I, I mean, I can't profess to know uh, XP inside out, but the uh, the whole principle of um, writing efficient code, there's a difference between efficiency and optimization. Efficiency to me is, uh, is not being wasteful and deliberately not being wasteful. Once you have an efficient program, you can optimize it and still make it a lot better. But if you start off with um, a very inf inefficient mindset, it's really hard, I've always found, to squeeze it down even to where just an efficient person can get to, much less do the optimization that comes later. So, um, just sloppy programming might get you something, I shouldn't call it sloppy, but just bursting through and writing a lot of code. Um, there's times when I've been successful at it, but if I think back, the reason I was successful at it is I actually had been thinking about the problem for, you know, days or weeks ahead of time, I just hadn't written anything down. And so by the time I actually sat down, I did write a lot of code in a short bit of time, but most of it had been in my head for a long time. And then it's a question of getting your fingers to actually move fast enough. So um, I really, it's really hard to squeeze things down. Um, it's a lot easier to make them get bigger, my experience. Yes? One of your points was um, when hiring, when in doubt, say no. What are some of the doubts that you've come across? Um, the kind of things I've, I've come across, uh, sometimes you get a, re a resume that, uh, for example, has something just doesn't seem right. You know, there's a two-year gap between employment. Um, there's uh, the, the person who's had six jobs in the last two years, and they always have a good reason for every one of them. Um, I, I start to get doubts. Um, uh, when somebody, just in an interview, comes across the wrong way, um, we have one instance, I won't go into details on the person, but where we were almost ready to make them an offer and they said, oh, um, can we make the special arrangements with, for my pay so that my ex-wife doesn't get as much money from me? Um, we didn't hire them. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things and a lot of it is it's not formula driven, it's, it, it's very objective, which is you know, it's arts faculty stuff that you have to, <laughs> as opposed to math, but you just, somebody gives you the wrong feeling, um, too often, it, it just, it, it just gets magnified once, because you have to remember the person you're interviewing is on their best behavior, right? So this is, you have to say, this is what they're going to be on their absolute best day. What are they going to be on their worst day? <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I have the great pleasure of, of thanking you, David. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Don Cowan, and I've been around Waterloo forever. <laughs> and uh, I can testify to everything that David said. It's absolutely right on. The, uh, to answer, though, there's a question up here about making life better, if you will. And when this uh, we first, <coughs> the committee that needs to decide on this award made its decision, uh, the next day an email was sent to the individual who was selected, namely David Yaw, who received it on his Blackberry in Hawaii <laughs> with his family on vacation. Okay, so it's not all bad. <laughs> I'd just like to quibble with one little thing you said. You said you used a biblical thing and said in the beginning. I think it's more like in a beginning because we keep going through the same cycle time after time after time. That is, we... we <clears throat> increase human efficiency, then we increase human use, now we have to go back and fix up the machine efficiency and the environment efficiency, and back we go again, we increase the use, and it just keeps going through this. We're doing different things, but we're still, in effect, following the same basic model. So, thank you very, very much for a great talk. Thank you.